Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say, say among the nation, the Lord reigns. The world, the world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. The second the second reading comes from Revelation chapter 7, and you'll find that on the back of the green handout. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, and wisdom and thanks and honour, and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, it is a real privilege uh, to be here and to share and open God's word with you. Um, I wanted to begin by sharing two quick stories. Uh, the first is from uh, just over eight weeks ago, the day that our daughter Anna was born. In fact, about an hour after she was born. There's my beautiful new baby girl. She's quiet and calm, which is a bit of a relief at this point. Um, her head is laid down against and her eyes are looking up into my astonishingly resilient and strong wife's face. And we hold up the phone. We FaceTime our little boy, Caleb, who's, who, who, who's, who's staying with, his, with Avril's parents. And I see his big smile light up uh, the, phone, uh, the phone screen. And he says with that big smile, Hello, hello, baby. Hello, baby, Anna. You're my little sister. <laughs> so, so sweet, right? Now, the second story is from a few days ago. And again, it's about uh, Caleb. Um, he, Caleb, he's about to walk past me uh, and he looks at me and then he runs over and he gives me this big hug. And then he continues on his way, looks back over his shoulder oh, and he runs back and gives me another hug. Um, then he runs off and he plays with his toys. Um, whether they are big things or small things, there are things that just make your heart sing, aren't there? The moment that you watch the Matildas make the World Cup semifinals, 
the moment that you hear that loved one pull into your driveway, or perhaps the moment your barista calls your coffee order is ready. There are things big and small that just make our hearts sing. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. I wonder where does that statement sit in your heart? Where does the thought of seeing old and new voices praising God sit in your heart? Well, in Psalm 96, uh, the, the writer, the psalmist, is assembling this imaginary choir of enormous proportions, all people, every man, woman, and child. So great is the song that he seeks to conduct that he captures, in fact, all of creation in its performance. Every brook is a soprano. Every mountain is a tenor. The psalmist provides a picture of the universal praise of God. Great is the Lord, he says, and most worthy of praise. Now, as this psalmist casts his musical vision, what he's really seeking to do is bring our hearts along with him. That is, he wants us to capture his passion. He wants us to tune our hearts to his longings, to his desire, so that we might long with him, desire with him for the universal praise of our God. It's great that you're doing September Psalms. Um, uh, so the Psalms, as you know, is a, is a wonderful parts of Scripture given to us in order to teach us not only how to think as followers of the Lord Jesus, but also how to feel as the followers of the Lord Jesus. The Psalms, with their poetry, engage our hearts, pluck at our desires. And this Psalm, Psalm 96, tugs at our hearts and says, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if the world knew Jesus? Wouldn't it just make you sing if all of Mittagong knew the Lord Jesus? If all of the Southern Highlands knew the Lord Jesus, wouldn't it be just the best thing that could happen if your neighbours, your friends and all your family knew the Lord Jesus? This psalm tunes our hearts for mission, makes us think of a world that knows him, and consider just how wonderful that would be. So as we come to this psalm, with all that it has to teach us and tune us, would you, would you pray with me that God will do just that? Father, would you open our hearts as we open your word, challenge us, refresh us, humble us and grow us to know and serve your son. Amen. So if you've looked at your outlines on those green pieces of paper, you'll see that we're looking at the psalm in two parts. The first part is the God who deserves the praise of the world. And the second part is the world who wants to praise God. So we're going to start with that first one, the, the God who deserves the praise of the world. So look down with me, if you will, at verse one. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Sing, sing, sing. Psalm 96 is a call to worship. It's an urging to sing, a calling to sing a new song to the Lord. Now, new songs, you might be familiar if you've read parts of the Bible there are, um, that mention a new song. It happens nine times across the Bible. And in every time it appears in the context of a great salvation. So after Israel crosses the Red Sea, Moses and the people sing a new song, celebrating God's great deliverance of them from slavery. At the end of the Bible, in Revelation, the people sing a new song, again, as the lamb who looks slain appears now to finally fulfill God's plan of bringing all things under his feet. New songs signal that God has done something remarkable, something that has changed everything for those who now sing it. New songs come from mouths attached to minds full of gratitude and wonder that God has done something wonderful for them. I wonder if you have a experience that, you, that comes to mind of singing a song and, and feeling and knowing um, and reflecting on the God's great salvation and God's great mercy to you. Um, I, what comes to mind very quickly to me is singing that great song, I've Decided to Follow Jesus, 
no turning back. No, t I, I won't try and sing it for you up here. But um, what comes to mind, singing that song as a young adult at a conference, it tears down my eyes as I reflect um, and am struck afresh by the wonderful mercy uh, of the Lord Jesus to me, a, a deep sinner. There is so much that we have to praise God for. The wonders of his wisdom in creation, the depths of love, his love in redemption, so much that we now know, so much that provokes in us a new song, I hope. We have so much that rightly stirs our hearts to longing as well, that not just our tongue, but every tongue be filled with saying just how wonderful he is. Now, I wonder if you noticed as we were reading this psalm, who it is that is called to sing it. Who is called to sing the new song? It's a bit hard to miss right there in verse one, as we say, sing to the Lord, all the earth. Uh, sing to the Lord, who all the earth. The psalm was written by Israel, but its call extends far beyond it. The psalm isn't is summoning just Israel to sing to the Lord. It's summoning the whole world. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Now, there's a strange dynamic that's going on here, and I think it'll pay off just to listen carefully to this point. Um, the psalm is addressed to the whole world, to all of creation, sing to the Lord, all the earth, but it wasn't sung to the whole earth. It wasn't sung to all the earth. Now, what do I mean by that? There's one place in the Bible where we know for sure that this psalm was sung, one occasion that it was sung at, and that is in 1 Chronicles 16. If you're a Bible buff, maybe you're already thinking, what could it possibly be? Well, it's when the, when the ark of God was brought by David into Jerusalem and placed into the tabernacle. If you're familiar at all with that piece of, that part of Scripture, it's a really happy day. It's a wonderful day. King David's leading a grand parade, a great procession, and they're dancing all the way into Jerusalem with great joy as the ark, which represented God's blessing and God's promise, is brought into the city. And on that day, we're told they sing together Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord all the earth they sung. The only problem was the whole earth wasn't with them at the time. In fact, this was a celebration by Israel for Israel with only Israelites invited. When Israel sung this song, the nations of the world weren't in the room. Israel sings to Israel a song addressed to the world. That's a bit weird, isn't it? It's a bit weird, but it makes sense as a song sung by people who aren't content to praise God alone. That's not enough. When they look around at each other, they say, this isn't enough. Our praise, just our praise alone, isn't enough to recognize how great, how wonderful our great God is, how great and wonderful his salvation is. It's one that causes them to look around the room and say, I do not want to see another empty chair in this place ever again. I want this place jammed full. In fact, I want every place jammed full of people praising the Lord because he deserves the praise of everyone in this nation and everyone in every other nation as well. God deserves the praise of the whole world. It's meant as a G-up. Do you know what I mean by that? A G up? Perhaps the front row can interpret it for you. Um, you know what I mean by that? It's a hype up. It's, 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 it's infectious enthusiasm. It's a building of energy together, encouraging each other um, that this God we follow, this God shouldn't just get our praise. As we sing this song to one another, we encourage one another that our God is so impressive, that what he's, that what he's done for us is so good that he's worthy to be praised for the, by the whole world as well. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for every tongue of every nation to sing to my God because he deserves it. That's this psalm. It's the imaginations of a congregation called wild with the wondrous thought of a world praising God. Now, dreams come back down to reality, though, in verse 2, with a call to proclaim his salvation day after day, to declare his glory among the nations. It's almost as if they've said, if we want the whole world to praise our God, well, I guess we're going to have to go and get them. If God deserves the praise of the earth, then we can't keep his salvation secret, is what verse 2 is saying. 
How will the people be drawn to his praise? Well, only if we tell him what he's done. God's goodness, his character, we know it's known in what he's done. His glory is known in his acts uh, in his of salvation, in his marvelous deeds. Only by speaking about them can we draw people into his praise. Those who sing the song of Psalm 96 long to, to speak of his marvelous deeds day after day among all nations, all peoples. You see there how he's, the, the psalmist is drawing in every dimension every dimension of time, day after day, every dimension of space, everywhere, everyone, every time, drawing more and more people into the praise of the God who deserves it. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Friends, what is your heart for Midagong? What is your desire for the Southern Highlands? What's your longing for the world? What is it that you want for your unbelieving children or, or, or partners or friends or neighbours? This psalm plucks our hearts and encourages us to say, boy, oh boy, does God deserve their praise. Um, I've had the privilege of leading a few friends to Jesus. Uh, nothing special involved, uh, was involved in it, just praying for them, offering to read the Bible with them, and then witnessing God do the work as he met them in his word. Can I tell you, though, seeing these friends join with me in church join with me in singing with joy about our salvation, I know that they found is just awesome. That is a moment to make your heart sing, can I tell you? A wonderful moment. But Psalm 96 challenges me a little bit in this moment because it tells me that the cause of my joy in that moment, the thing that ought to make my heart sing in that moment, is not first because of the salvation of one of my friends, as wonderful as that is, because it's not first about them. Rather, it is first about God. What brings me joy, what should make my heart sing before all other things in that moment, is that from the mouth of another one who, whom God made and loves, he is receiving the praise that he deserves. After all, what's the alternative? In verse 4 and 5, the gods that they currently offer their praise to, the ones who receive their offerings of time and talent and treasure are nothing but idols. The gods the world trusts in are idols. That, that word idols there uh, literally means nothings. They do nothing. They can do nothing. They will do nothing powerlessness next to what this psalm paints as the all-powerful God, who we know is the all-powerful God. Only one God is worthy of praise. Only one God made the heavens. Only one God has splendor and majesty, strength and honor going before him and around him. Uh, the sense there, I think, is like police cars and secret service in a motorcade surrounding the president, that kind of glory and splendor attending the Lord this God ought to receive the praise of the world. All people ought, from verse 8, ascribe to him the glory due his name. Now, Andrew led us uh, through a reflection on the first line of the Lord's Prayer just a bit earlier. Well, how often have you considered the second line as well? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the same request that's the same desire that's behind this psalm. The desire that the world wouldn't mock God, but instead honour him and acknowledge him as they ought. Friends, I hope this psalm is plucking at your heart, stirring in you a longing that God be given the praise of the world because he deserves it. That's the first thing that this psalm shows us. The second thing is that the world actually wants to worship our God. Um, if you asked any person in this, on the street, what do they most want in life? What do you think they'd say? Money, yeah, money. There's probably plenty of other things you can think of. Why not? Shout them out. What other things might they? What, what other things might they want? Happiness, yeah, happiness. 
and money as a way to happiness, right? Yeah, anything else? Love and peace, that's right. Love, peace, happiness. Well, this psalm says that God is the source of so much that the world wants. I mean, there's salvation and rescue in verse 2. I even think there's happiness in verses 11 and 12. And in verse 5, there is even fulfillment, self-actualization perhaps, fulfillment at least, found in the move from empty, nothing idols to the worship of the God who made the heavens. But the psalm doesn't focus on those things. I think the psalm focuses instead on two things, two things which the world, I think, seems to want more than anything in the world, more than anything else at the moment, if they were honest. And those are stability and justice. Stability and justice. And both of those, I think, come in verse 10. Have a look down there. It says, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. This is God's rule. And it's, a, it's not just a statement about God being sovereign today, the Lord reigns. That's not a statement about God being sovereign today, as true as that is. It's a phrase that actually looks forward, anticipates something coming, something new. It's the news of, a, of, of God's kingdom come in full. That's what's anticipated by that statement, the Lord reigns. When will it end? We heard that question a lot during the COVID years, didn't we? When will it end? We hear, we continue to hear it now, I think, as we look at conflicts ongoing in Europe, as we look at poverty and corruption across Africa, even as we think closer to home uh, about the chronic increasing cost of living or the more acute and repeated times of bushfire and floods, when will it end? The psalm says that the God who made the heavens, he reigns. And under him, the world is firmly established. That phrase, the world is firmly established, it's a phrase that's connected in the Bible to the ruling of God over his creation. Only he has the power to finally bring it to peace and to rest. Only he has the power to bring it to stability. Only with him restraining it can it never be moved. The promise of this psalm is that the God who has fixed, who, who fixed the world on its foundations, who set order over his creation, that his rule is coming in fullness to bring the stability that we long for. But not only stability, God will judge the peoples with equity. God will bring justice and judgment. So much that happens, uh, so much happens in a world in our world for which we rightly want justice. And um, before moving into ministry, I studied law. I actually studied under Cass for a little while. Um, and after graduating for uh, from law, I worked for a year with the government as a paralegal. I worked on cases that came out of the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Abuse. We were responding to claims made against government schools and prisons and hospitals. And can I tell you? that there has been no time in my life where I have longed for justice more than the first week on that job. And yet the justice that we sought to give was so weak and so insufficient. In a world of so much injustice, with governments and court systems only so capable of ensuring justice is done, don't we long for justice, true justice? Doesn't our world long for that, to finally be treated fairly, for finally wrongs to be written, right, righted? God is coming to judge. Look at verses 11 to 13, and in it you see creation getting very excited. The heavens are rejoicing, the earth is being glad, the sea is resounding, the fields are being jubilant, the trees are singing for joy, heavens, earth, sea, fields, everything in all of them, rejoicing, being glad, being jubilant, resounding, singing for joy. The psalm is really laboring the point in this section, isn't it? Where every word for rejoicing in the thesaurus is kind of being dumped out to describe how every aspect of creation is responding to the Lord. It's a universal creation-wide call to joy. 
all of creation swept up into the joy of what verse 13 announces. Look down there at verse 13. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. Creation is beside itself because the Lord is coming and coming to judge. It's interesting that justice is not the enemy of joy. So, so, so often we can think that it is. It's easy to think that the, of the idea of God's judgment quite negatively to want to avoid those passages in the Bible. But this psalm doesn't have any hesitation whatsoever in holding joy and justice together. Creation rejoicing at God's coming in righteousness and truth to judge. His coming to judge here, and his coming to judge here isn't just the idea of his, him coming to punish people for wrongdoing, although that is certainly part of it, and that will happen. People will be held accountable for how they've treated God and treated others. But God's judgment here is also far richer than that because it's a judgment that involves restoration. It's the creation who groans under, under sin being turned into the creation that rejoices under the rule and justice of God's reign. Because God judges with righteousness and God's judgment brings restoration. His judging will be according, a judging that will be according to gracious promises made to his people, a judgment that vindicates his people and a judgment that sets right his universe for rejoicing. By describing God's judgment this way, the psalm is looking forward, um, I think, I, I, I think this is true. God, the psalm is looking forward to God's judgment of us in Jesus. A judgment that was against us, but now rests in another. A judgment paid in full by Jesus. And so therefore, a judgment that sets us free and restores us, brings us to rejoicing, brings us a salvation that provokes a new song. This is the justice that God's kingdom brings, a justice that not only deals with the evil we see and hate in the world, but a justice that restores and vindicates God's people and a justice that returns God's world to how he designed it. So that's Psalm 96. It's a song of Israel. It's a summons to the world. It's a summons to tune our hearts to long for the world to sing a new song of salvation and restoration in praise of our God. A new song to the God and King whose reign ensures stability, justice, and joy for all creation. Well, how are we going to tune our hearts? How are we going to tune our hearts to long to see this song on the lips of our neighbours and on, our, on the lips of the nations? Well, we first have to contend with busy, don't we? It's so easy for busy to become the norm. You ask most people, how are you? How often do you hear in reply, oh, I'm busy? Um, almost more often than not, don't we? There's never enough time. We have to pay bills, raise kids, visit doctors, plan holidays, pay for those holidays, um, deal with conflict, deal with drama. It's all too easy for us to follow along in that constant stream of things in front of us and forget to lift our eyes above the, their horizon and see that there is a great and sovereign God who is doing something with the world, who is doing something with us, who is drawing a people from every tribe, nation and tongue to rejoice and worship him with joy, as we saw in that second reading. Friends, let your heart be tuned by this psalm. Let it lift your eyes. We have a God who deserves the praise of the world, and wouldn't it just make your heart sing to see Mittagong, to see the highlands, to see Australia, see the world, even see Madagascar, caught up in his praise. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's a far more challenging prayer than we often care to admit, isn't it? But a joyful heart who loves our God and wants to see him magnified will be oh so willing to pray it. 
oh so willing to give of ourselves, to give away ourselves in the service of his name being hallowed, of him receiving the praise of the nations. Friends, it's a heart that belongs to every Christian. Whether you stand up here ready to go to Madagascar, whether you sit and consider your friends and family and neighbours who don't yet know Jesus, when you think about your prayer for two people, whether we go or whether we stay, we all long for and work together for a world that praises God and waits for him to bring it to the joy of his stability and his judgment. Would you pray with me? Father, you are great and most worthy of praise. Would you help us long together for the world to know and acknowledge this, that your great glory, your strength, your splendor, the marvellous works of your salvation would lead our friends and our family and our neighbours, our city and our world to worship you, to worship you who's the one who meets our deepest desires so fully in your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Adam, for that powerful sermon and that encouragement and challenge um, as we reflect on God's purpose for mission and um, the part each of us here can play in that. We now come to our final song, which is also our offertory song. Uh, for our regular members, this is an opportunity to partner with Mac and our various ministries, including the friend family and supporting them. Um, having said that, please don't feel obliged to contribute today if you don't wish to or can't. Uh, many, of mem many, many members of Mac give electronically and we'll just let the bag uh, pass by as it comes around. I'll just say a quick prayer of thanks for the offertory. Gracious God, all things come from you, and you teach us to be generous with what we have. We pray that our gifts may be wisely used for the ministry of the gospel and the relief of those in need. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we have just heard, the Lord reigns. So let's stand and sing praises to our one true God. Please stand and sing. I was an orphan lost there before, running away when I'd be your boy. Father, you were.